<laughs> but anyways, uh, I would like to talk to you here about biocentrism, which is a new theory of everything which arrives at the same conclusions as non-duality. So every now and then, a very simple but radical idea uh, shakes the foundations of knowledge. So when the discovery of the Earth, uh, that it wasn't flat, challenged the way people perceived themselves in their uh, relationship with the surroundings. Our ancestors were challenged to believe that the Earth was round, even though the ground they walked on was flat. And nothing in everyday experience revealed anything about the truth of this idea. So if the earth was really round, it was argued that people at the bottom would fall off. So it was considered complete nonsense 500 years ago. So likewise, biocentrism uh, is turning the world upside down again with the seemingly simple idea that the universe arises from life, not the other way around. So switching the perspective of the universe from physics to biology undoes everything we know about uh, the universe and, and life in it. We think that life is just an accident of physics, but a long list of experiments suggests exactly the opposite. Amazingly, if you add life and consciousness to the equation, you can explain some of the biggest puzzles in science. For instance, it becomes clear why space and time, indeed the properties of matter themselves, depend on the observer. It also becomes clear why the laws of the universe itself are fine-tuned for the existence of life. So until we recognize the universe in our head, attempts to understand the world uh, remain a road to nowhere. So scientists fail to recognize those properties of life that make it critical for our existence. So the view of the world uh, in which life and consciousness are bottom line to understanding the larger uh, universe is called biocentrism. And it revolves around the way our consciousness relates to a physical process. It's a vast mystery that I've pursued my entire life with a lot of help along the way. So I've come to conclusions that would shock many of my colleagues and predecessors, placing biology above the other sciences, in particular physics and chemistry, in an attempt to understand a theory of everything that has eluded these other disciplines. We're taught since, since childhood that the universe is divided into two entities, ourselves and that which is outside of us. So this seems logical. Self is commonly defined by that that we can control. So I can move my fingers, but I can't wiggle your toes. The dichotomy then is based largely on control and manipulation. So the basic biology, however, tells us that we don't control most of the trillions of cells in the body any more than we do control a rock or, or a tree. So consider everything around you right now, me up here at the podium, your hands, your body. Language and custom all say that that's outside us in the external world. But you can't see anything through the vault of bone surrounding your brain. <clears throat> everything you see and experience right now, your body, the walls, the ceilings of this room, are active, an active process that's occurring in your mind. You are this process. You're not just the part that you control. So, so your eyes just aren't portals to the world. You think you just see out there, but again, you can't see through the cranium. So what you're seeing, again, is everything that you think right there is out there is actually a construction happening moment to moment in your mind. So again, I want to emphasize that this is all happening in your head, and even the light from the bulbs in this room, they're moving through a space that's actually created in your mind. So consider everyday reality. So for instance, the weather outside. You see a blue sky out there, but the cells in your brain could be changed so that, the, the, that everything that's, that's blue looks green or red. Could even do a little genetic engineering so that everything that's red makes a noise or vibrates or makes you want to have sex like some birds. Uh, or for instance, you think it's bright out. The circuits in your brain could be changed so that it's, it's dark. You think it's, it's hot and humid, but a to a tropical frog, it would look cold and, and dry. So this logic applies to virtually everything. Bottom line is, and the first principle of biocentrism is, is that, is that reality involves your consciousness. It could not be there without, without your consciousness. Emerson once said, we have learned that we do not see directly, but immediately, and that we have no means for correcting the colored and distorted lenses which we are, or of computing the amount of their errors. Perhaps these subjective lenses have a creative power. Perhaps there are no objects. So why is everyone surprised at the experimental findings of quantum theory? It's because we're still operating in a severely outdated paradigm. 
We still believe there's an external world that exists independent of the perceiving subject. So philosophers and physicists from Plato to Hawking have debated this. Niels Bohr, the great Nobel physicist, uh, once said, not so. When we're measuring something, we're forcing an undetermined, undefined world to assume an experimental value. We're not measuring the world, we're creating it. And this is from a physicist. And at the legendary debates, Einstein presented ingenious uh, ideas supporting the idea of a real world out there. But Bohr shot every one of them down one by one and gradually convinced his colleagues uh, of his point of view. Today, however, most people still believe there's an external world out there. This issue, of course, is ancient and, and predates uh, biocentrism, which, which of course explains why one view and not the other uh, has to be correct. So let's consider a little of the, of the physics, the real experiments. Consider the famous two-hole experiment. When scientists watch a particle go through two holes in the barrier, it acts like a little bullet and logically goes through one hole or the other. But if you don't watch it, it behaves like a wave and can go, and can go through both holes uh, at the same time. So why should a particle out there change its behavior depending on whether you watch it or not? And of course, the answer is that reality is a process that involves your consciousness. Or, and again, there have been many, many versions of that experiment. Uh, consider Eisenberg's famous uncertainty principle. If there was really a world out there with particles just bouncing around, then we should certainly be able to measure all of their properties. But you can't. So for instance, a particle's exact location and its momentum can't be known at the same time. So why should it matter to matter or to particles what you decide to measure? Again, the answer is simple. The particles aren't just out there. Again, we can go on and on. One more entangled particles you've probably heard of. How can particles possibly instantaneously be connected at opposite sides of the galaxy out there in, in violation of, of the speed of light? Again, they're not just out there. Space and time are tools of our mind. They're forms of, of animal understanding. So this is the problem in a nutshell, is, is that we look at the world like a chickmunk or a squirrel. The squirrel opens his eyes and sees the, the acorn and it's just miraculously there. He grabs it and he scurries up the tree without any further thought. And we humans are the same. We wake up in the morning and the world is just magically there. We go through life, we drool completely oblivious to what's going on around us in the world. But experiment after experiment shows that not a single particle out there exists with real properties until it's observed. So it doesn't take a genius to realize that, this, that reality is a process, again, that involves consciousness. So what we need to do is replace the old physics with a new biology. Space and time aren't these hard, cold uh, objects out there. Sort of, sort of like the pebbles and the shells you pick up along the seashore. No, wave your hand through the air. If you take everything away, what's left? Nothing. And the same thing is for time. You can't put it in a bottle like milk. So again, all of experience is just information that's occurring inside your mind. And space and time are the mind's tools for putting it all together. We even do it in dreams with your eyes closed. You can be on the, on the beach with bright lights just as real as we're, we are here in this room. Your mind has the ability to create space and time just like it does in dreams. And in, in schizophrenics, anyone who may be a doctor realizes that those patients see people right beside them in reality just like this, just as real as you and I right now. But that's just part of the, 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 the equation. Again, you know, you have to look at what's going on in, in science, not just with the experiments, but in terms of observation. So it turns out that biocentrism may be the only rational way to explain the structure of the universe itself. So the cosmos, it turns out, has a long list of traits that make it appear as if everything was exactly tailor-made just for us. The cosmos has an incredibly unlikely list of traits that make it not to this, not to that, uh, for life to exist. So for instance, the Big Bang. If it was one pot in a millionth more powerful, it would have rushed out too fast for galaxies and worlds to, to be here. Again, the result, no us. If the strong nuclear force would decrease by 2%, uh, atomic nuclei would not hold together. Plain vanilla uh, uh, hydrogen would be the only uh, element in, in the universe. Again, if the gravitational constant were decreased just a slight, just a hair, stars, including the sun, wouldn't ignite. There are over 200 parameters so exact. These could be any, any number, anything, but they're exactly just right for life to exist. 
And so, again, if you tweak any of them, you never existed. So it turns out the long sought after theory of everything is really just merely missing one important component that was too close to us to have noticed. So some of the thrill that came with the announcement of the human genome had been mapped or that, uh, that we understand the big, we're understanding the Big Bang, it rests in our desire for completeness and totality. So these comprehensive theories, all of them, feel right now to take into account one critical factor, and that is that we're creating them. That we're the biological creature that fashions the stories, that makes the observations, and it gives names to things. And therein lies the great expanse of, of, of our errors. And that is, is that science hasn't confronted the one thing that's most familiar and most mysterious. And that is, of course, consciousness. And that is, of course, consciousness. And that is, of course, consciousness. And that is, of course, consciousness.